Reggae just extra with Ras Dennis. It is an undeniable fact that Rastafari movement has its roots in the philosophy of Marcus Garvey, a man that lived a life with a mission, although his journey may have seemed impossible. His never-ending strength and dedication caused many people's dreams and wishes to become realities. Marcus Garvey is considered a prophet by his followers due to the inspiration he brought to the black race. He took a group of people that thought they had no place in this world and united them together which gave them pride in their race. Even though he could not find enough support for his movement to succeed in Jamaica, Garvey gave Rastas the guidance they needed to rise above their oppressors which led them to create the Rastafari movement. My name is Rast Dennis, and you are welcome back to another video by Reggae Gist Extra. You are now watching Reggae Gist Extra's Marcus Garvey's edition. This episode is strictly about Marcus Mosiah Garvey, an orator for the Black Nationalism and Pan-Africanism movements, to which end he founded the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League. Kindly stay tuned to learn a thing or two and do remember to subscribe to this channel, like, share and most importantly hit the notification bell to be the first to watch our next video. This is the place to be for your refugees, facts and culture. Marcus Garvey was born in Jamaica on August 17, 1887 in the little town of St. Anne's Bay. He grew up in a family that had a very strong sense of closeness and unity, similar to most Jamaican families. He watched his father stand up for himself at all costs whenever he was struggling. This atmosphere encouraged Marcus to pursue his goals and not let anything stand in his way. This is how he found the courage to succeed in life, even if the color of his skin could hinder his success. Marcus expressed to his followers that the color of their skin signified a glorious symbol of national greatness. He brought hope to many people's lives. When Marcus was 14, he had to drop out of school and get a job to help support his family financially. He got a job in Kingston, Jamaica at a printing press with his godfather. This taught Marcus the printing trade and many journalistic techniques that helped him out later on in life. By the time Marcus was 20, he became a master printer and got the stimulation to start organizing public meetings in favor of his fellow workers. This started his life as an orator. He also developed the speaking skills he needed in order to uplift a group of people that felt they had no opportunities in society. Through these public meetings and encouragement from a well-educated Negro, Dr. Joseph Robert Love, a key figure in Pan-Africanism between 1890 and 1914 chanting Africa for the Africans, Marcus realized that he had the chance to improve the life of black workers. This is when he realized he had to devote his life to establishing a program to enlighten all black people of their opportunities in this world. Garvey then went to Costa Rica where he anticipated making enough money to come back to Jamaica and start his organization. But he continued to travel and went to Limon in Costa Rica, Panama City in Panama, and London in England where he established a few newspapers and saw the conditions of black people in various places. In 1914, Garvey came home to Jamaica and was ready to start his program and liberate his race. Garvey was determined that the black man would not continue to be kicked about by all the other races and nations of the world. He wanted to restore black people's dignity which slavery and colonization had tried to degrade. He wanted that blacks stop thinking they were inferior beings and that they acquire knowledge, technical and financial means so as to free themselves from the yoke of white people. With these motives, Garvey entitled his organization the Universal Negro Improvement and Conservation Association and African Communities League. In Jamaica, Garvey started his movement but did not find the support he wished for from the black community. Many black people disliked him because they did not want to classify themselves as Negroes. Ironically, in Jamaica his largest supporters were white. They wanted to better the life of the Negroes in Jamaica. This did not discourage Garvey, and he decided to see if he could receive more support for his program in the United States. He wrote to the founder of the Tuskegee Institute and received an eager invitation to come to the United States to share their ideas. 
He went to the United States on March 23, 1916, hoping to seek help from Booker T. Washington, but by the time Garvey got to the United States, Booker T. Washington passed away. When Garvey got to New York, he found many black Americans were eager to hear what he had to say, because he got there at a time when there were not many opportunities for black people. There was an enormous difference in the reaction of the blacks in Jamaica and the United States, but Garvey saw the conditions in both countries to be the primary reason. It was just at the end of World War I and many people in the United States did not have any way to improve their lives. As well with the abolishment of slavery, there was an increase in mobility out of the South. He established the Negro World newspaper so he could express his ideas and philosophies. Garvey's motto was one God, one aim, one destiny. Garvey also set off to establish his international organization, which he knew would rise. The UNIA, Universal Negro Improvement Association, was founded in 1917 and contained 2,000 members within three weeks. The UNIA was established so Marcus could promote his famous slogan Africa for the Africans and encourage his Back to Africa movement. Garvey also formed the Black Star Line Steamship Company to transport black people back to Africa. There was stock sold for this company to any black person that had the desire to travel back to Africa. This was Garvey's way of putting his words in action. Many people thought the idea of actually buying a boat to transport people back to Africa was a ridiculous idea, but Garvey did not let this stop him. He purchased his first ship, named the Yarmouth, which could hold 1,452 gross tons. It took the Yarmouth time to get the necessary funds to go on its first voyage, but in November 1919 the ship was ready for its first voyage. Later the Black Star Line bought three more ships and with struggle these voyages continued to Africa. Most of Garvey's voyages, including his first, had a few problems it had to overcome before sailing out to the sea. Garvey had problems both insuring and financing the ships. Also, his only support came from his followers and was looked down upon by the majority of the population. You are now watching Reggae Just Extras Marcus Garvey's edition. On January 12, 1922, the FBI under J. Edgar Hoover arrested Garvey of mail fraud and stock irregularities related to the Black Star Line. Edgar Hoover was very eager to terminate Marcus Garvey's movement. At first, he was looking to charge Garvey with criminal activity, but could only accuse him of mail fraud. Hoover sent secret agents into Garvey's gatherings to investigate his actions. Hoover went as far as trying to deny Garvey a visa when he was coming back to United States from Central America and the West Indies. Garvey was able to get a visa, but Hoover did succeed in ending Garvey's career in the United States. In 1923, after a controversial trial, Garvey was found guilty and sentenced to a maximum of five years in prison. He blamed a Jewish judge and Jewish jurors for his conviction, saying that they sought retribution against him after he had agreed to meet with the Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan, KKK, several months prior to the trial. Garvey's success in mobilizing blacks earned him the suspicion of the U.S. government. His brand of nationalism also led to bitter feuds with other black leaders, including African Americans and West Indians. The most notable of Garvey's rivals, W.E.B. Du Bois, described him as dictatorial, domineering, inordinately vain, and very suspicious. President Calvin Coolidge altered his sentence and Garvey was deported back to Jamaica in 1927. When Garvey returned home to Jamaica, there were many people that were enthusiastic about his arrival. This gave Garvey the courage and inspiration to continue spreading his ideas and gathering people together. Even though Garvey could not find as much support in Jamaica as he expected, he was inspiration to many Rastafarians. Garvey was a major part of the rise of Rastafari movement and many Rastas look at Garvey as a prophet. Garvey continued his political activism and then moved to London in 1935. But he did not command the same influence he had earlier. Perhaps in desperation or maybe in delusion, Garvey collaborated with outspoken segregationist and white supremacist Senator Theodore Bilbo of Mississippi to promote a reparations scheme. 
The Greater Liberia Act of 1939 would deport 12 million African Americans to Liberia at federal expense to relieve unemployment. The act failed in Congress, and Garvey lost even more support among the black population. On June 1940, Garvey died in London at the age of 52 after several strokes due to travel restrictions during World War II. His body was interred in St. Mary's Roman Catholic Cemetery in Kensal Green, London. In 1964, his remains were exhumed and taken to Jamaica, where the government proclaimed him Jamaica's first national hero and reinterred him at a shrine in the National Heroes Park. But his memory and influence remain. His message of pride and dignity inspired many in the early days of the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 1960s. Marcus created the UNIA and had numerous goals he wanted it to achieve. In Garvey's words, he says, We've got to teach the American Negro blackness, black ideals, black industry, black United States, and black religion. Blacks of the entire universe linked up with one determination, that of liberating themselves and freeing the great country of Africa that is ours by right. These words gave many black people the ability to feel unified and equal. Garvey's influence on the Rastafarians is still so apparent, because if one listens to the lyrics in reggae music they will hear Garvey's name or movement being acknowledged. With the help of the Rastafarians, Garvey's name will never be forgotten and his legend will live on forever. Thanks for watching and do remember to subscribe, give it a like and post a positive comment in the comment section below and I'll see you again very soon for another video. Many thanks for watching Reggae Gist Extra with Ras Dennis.